Good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you here. And I know there are so many talks going on tonight on the campus. That this is indeed uh, the Renaissance elsewhere. If you're here for Nick Enfield's uh, inaugural or other lectures, this might be the time to leave, as they say on airlines. Um, my name is Mark Ledbury. I am the director of the Power Institute and the um, chair of the Department of Art History at the University of Sydney. And it's a great delight to welcome you all here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Sydney campuses are built on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to thank you all for coming and let you know that apart from uh, Alex's own seminar tomorrow that starts at 1.30 on, in Madison Building in the Seekinessa boardroom, we also have many other events. You know that you can't get away without my publicity moment. Um, for those of you who love the Renaissance, another unmissable event is on March the 21st at 6 p.m. in room 209 of the Mills Building, when Professor Patricia Simons from the University of Michigan will be here to talk about Tintoretto's Susanna and the Elders. And uh, any of you who know Pat's work and her, and, uh, her delivery style will know that she's a very engaging lecturer. I recommend you come to that. Before that, on March the 15th, the leading historian of photography, Jeffrey Batchen, is giving a lunchtime talk here in um, Mills 210, which is next to Mills 209 in the Mills building next to the Shaker Library, um, at 12.30, which is called Double Displacement, the Dissemination of the Photographic Image, which is all about kind of how photography migrates in some ways. Jeff's here to launch our wonderful new power publication, Jackie Redgate Mirrors, and some of you may have seen our invite to that too on, front, on Monday night. All right, enough of that. I would just, before I talk to you a little about our speaker tonight, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the continuing generosity of our supporters who keep the Power Institute active and able to fund such rich and deep programs. And especially tonight, I'd like to thank Terry Smith, whose support of the Power, particularly for bringing visiting speakers, has helped support the visit of Alex and his partner, the artist Amelia Saul, who will be coming to give a talk at SCA about her work on Wednesday the 23rd of March at SCA at 12.30. And more details of that will be on our website and in our newsletter. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners at Melbourne, and Dunlop, the new Herald Chair, and all her colleagues at Melbourne, and my colleague Alistair Blanchard at Brisbane, who have helped to arrange talks further on for Alex and Amelia, and who have been a very uh, collegial uh, sponsors and co-sponsors of, of Alex and Amelia's trip. Right. But to tonight, it is a great pleasure to be introducing Alexander, who I'm going to call Alex, slightly familiarly, but Alex Nagel tonight. Alex is Professor of Fine Arts and Director of Graduate Studies at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. Having taken his degrees at Berkeley and at Harvard, and also finding time, I think, for a, 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 de, a French degree at the University of Montpellier, I think, uh, during that spell. Um, he, he, uh, before taking up his professorship at New York, he taught at the University of Toronto, uh, as Associate Professor and then as Canada Research Chair. I won't name all his many honours and awards, which includes the Andrew W. Mellon Professorship at the Centre for Advanced Studies in New York, and fellowships including the, the very prestigious ones at Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin and many others. I would like instead, I think, to, without trying to capture the entire breadth and depth of Alex's publication list, simply talk about the kind of why he's been so exciting for the field of Renaissance studies. His first book, Michelangelo and the Reform of Art, which came out in 2000 with Cambridge University Press, really um, was not just a sort of uh, a very interesting re-examination of Michelangelo's practice, but also, among other things, of the altarpieces of form. He, he studied genre, what history painting actually meant at that time. He ruffled a lot of feathers and gave us lots of new questions to ask about Michelangelo, which is kind of this amazing achievement in itself. The book was honoured with the Phyllis Goodhart Gordon Prize for the best book in Renaissance studies, and it sort of established Alex as, a, as both a controversialist and someone who wants to provoke new questions. He continued to probe and challenge accepted views of Renaissance forms and genres, and his co-author book with Christopher Wood, um, Anachronic Renaissance, which came out in 2010, ramped up this challenge, I think, a few notches by forcing historians to think through the very vexed and complex questions of chronology, both within Renaissance art, but also in how we study the Renaissance, what we mean by the time of the Renaissance, what, what is it we're dealing with, what kind of layers of time we're dealing with. And along with other 
thinkers uh, of our moment, he has really stimulated whole new areas of study about what, what, what is the time for the image. This challenge and the, the sense of a sort of vital and continuing debate in the Renaissance was really a great achievement of that book. And it's, it's really that sense that, we're, that the Renaissance is not over. We didn't decide it all, and it was a lovely thing, and we all got it a few, you know, and now we're just living with our understanding of it. But in fact, that the Renaissance continually needs to be re-examined and remade in some ways. And of course, his latest book, The Controversy of the Renaissance Art, or The Controversy of the Renaissance Art, if you like, or in fact, it has two words in it which we can argue about the pronunciation of them, um, came out at the University of Chicago in 2011. I think, really, the great daring of that was to recast the Renaissance as a period not of triumphant aesthetic realization, but of experimentation itself, actually very explicitly about uncertainty, about controversy, even feud, at the center of which was the artist's studio and the artist's challenging practices. It's also a book which explores religious and philosophical interlocutors and opponents of the Renaissance. Like, where did iconoclasm go in the Renaissance? And, you know, his sort of, sort of examination of the persistence of iconoclastic currents as in, in the way that Renaissance uh, image, art making and image making happened is really very, uh, very subtle. You know, and it ends, and it has these wonderful analyses of works like the High Altar of Vincenzo Cathedral, which shift us away from the human figure towards the architectonic, towards the abstract. And this is all done in Alex's amazingly elegant um, prose style. And I, it's, it's, another, it's another thing that I think Alex has been very, uh, has been noticed for, and that's the fact that his, the way he speaks and writes is very communicative and very different, perhaps, from the kind of overwrought rhetoric of uh, previous generations. It's very, it's very elegant. And, but more for me, it really, I think it really tells us something about the ways that our history, the history of older art, can live and breathe. No subject is exhausted if you ask the right questions. So much remains to be probed, to be discovered. And that is at the heart of why we're all doing art history now and why we care about older art. I should say that Alex has also written very fluently original modern art on Smithson, on the relics inside modernity, on Jeff Koons even. And he's even recently delved into Hubert Robert and French art. He's living proof, I think, that the insights of those trained to deal with the dilemmas and conundrums presented by the art of the past are of enormous value to understanding the art of more recent times and of our own. So tonight's, um, uh, uh, tonight's lecture continues his restless re-examination of the Renaissance, embracing the complex material and cultural geographies of Renaissance art. His lecture tonight is entitled The Renaissance Elsewhere, Please welcome Alex Nagel. There's a light flashing here. I, 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 I feel like they're trying to warn you about something, <laughs> maybe about me. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for that very generous introduction. And many thanks to the Power Institute. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, particularly the people who make it run, uh, the ones that I've been most in touch with are, of course, Mark and uh, Vicky Mel. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I don't seem to have control of this. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're still in a uh, non-PowerPoint mode. Should I go into it? First, I'm going to let you read this rather long quotation. A 
Okay. This is a map from 1507. Fifteen years earlier, Columbus had embarked on his first voyage to the east. His brilliant idea, as you all know, was to do an end run around the Ottoman Turks, dominating the eastern Mediterranean, and reach Asia by heading inevitably in the other direction, sailing west to go east. His ambition to reach Asia was a traditional one, a very long-standing one. It was where the spices came from, it was where the silks came from, it was where paper and porcelain technology came from. If the earthly paradise is, the east, is in the easternmost part of the earth, as most people thought, it is where humanity came from. Hard to see the whole map, but I'll show you the part that uh, most interests us. And here, 1507, 15 years after that first Asiatic expedition of Columbus, you can see that Asia is still uh, very close on the horizon. So just to orient you a little bit, uh, I hope this has a good oh. uh, This is uh, Hispaniola, the present day Dominican Republic, Haiti, where Columbus established his first colony. This is just the very um, uh, northern part of what we now call South America, which Columbus discovered on a later voyage. Um, this is uh, the island we now call Cuba. It was variously named over uh, the years at this time. And you can see there's a banderole here that basically says, we're not sure where the edge of this land is. Um, Columbus thought that it was actually part of the mainland, just a few rivers away from um, places like Kinsai. So Kinsai is right here. That's um, the capital Hangzhou that Marco Polo described in elaborate detail in his voyage. This is a text that Columbus knew well. And not far off from there on this map is Tibet, just to uh, orient you a little bit. Um, until fairly recently, I thought that this idea, the idea that America was somehow part of Asia, was a short-lived one, an idea quickly dispelled in the next years by Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe in 1522, for example, and by the exploration and colonization of the American continent. But in fact, the Amerasia complex, as I now call it, was spectacularly resilient and long-lasting. Here's a map of six decades later. Um, uh, and you can see that still here, Japan is off the coast of California. Um, just north is the Gulf of China, across which clearly labeled is the Parte di Asia. And this map also shows Kinsai, Hangzhou. As late as the 1630s, Jean Nicolet, one of the foremost explorers in Champlain's expedition, encountered the Winnebago's of present-day Wisconsin. And accordingly, he presented himself in an embroidered Chinese silk robe, appropriate garb, he thought, for his imminent encounter with the representatives of the Chinese court he was expecting to meet there. Now, this topic, the persistence of the Amerasia idea, uh, which is a project I'm undertaking with a colleague in history named Elizabeth Herodowicz, is actually the stuff of another lecture. Um, but that is just to set up uh, maybe a more uh, familiar set of reference points for what I'm going to talk about in this lecture, which is the period preceding the period launched by um, Columbus's expeditions. Today I'm going to talk about the period between Marco Polo and Columbus, the period between the two globalisms, we might call it. That is to say, the 14th and 15th centuries. This was the period when one looked eastward to Asia. 
when one saw Asia not through direct contact, but through maps and travel accounts, and above all, through art. Everything I'm going to say uh, for the next number of minutes uh, proceeds from the premise that an orientation eastward was not only basic to late medieval Western culture, but was in many ways a determining condition of its art. So for me, orientation, and by that I really mean looking eastward, was basic to what we call early Renaissance art. Excuse me, can I just hit you? Would you mind putting your microphone onto your tie? It's a little bit hard to hear you. Oh, is it? It sounds to me like it's booming. Are you able to hear in the back at all? Yeah, uh, so maybe there's a pocket here. Yeah. Is that better for you? That's better, thanks. Good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The most European thing about European art of this period was, I propose, its other orientedness. That is what made this art what it is. Now, again, I'm talking about the period 1300 to 1500. After 1500, European art um, goes through, I think, a rather important shift. And I think this is really what we're going to be talking about tomorrow in the seminar. It becomes Europe-centered, not to say Eurocentric. So back to 1300. The painting is divided left and right. To Christ's right are his saintly companions, and at his left, our right, are his murderers. One of the soldiers has just now been converted, as the Gospels say, and already he wears a halo. Above, angels collect the blood of Christ, grimace in pain, and bare their breasts in agony. At the bottom right of the scene, the Roman soldiers vie for Christ's tunic, now empty of his body. The tunic is like a character in the story, empty and yet buoyant, as if filled by an invisible presence. It is rather like tunics produced in the Eastern Mediterranean at the time of Giotto, the painter, but with the difference that Christ's garment is, as the Gospel says, all of one piece. The tunic is not a gift, since it was stolen from a murdered man's back. Nor is it a traded good, since it will be won in a game of chance. It is a pure object of transfer. In their vying over the prize, the Roman soldiers initiate the cult of Christ's relics, though, of course, they know not what they are doing. The exception is the soldier who recognizes Christ, saying, truly, this is the Son of God, the one who carries a halo and is not part of the group throwing lots for the garment. Held up by the soldiers, the tunic seems to be under arrest, slouching downward as if submitting to more abuse, except that now their aim is not to destroy it, but to keep it whole. Uh, since we have this nice detail, I will have you note the presence of this rather strange-looking script. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now, but um, I think very effective comparisons have been made between that script and the script introduced by uh, the Mongol Empire to regulate the vast expanse that they had conquered, the Paspa script. There's every reason to imagine that Giotto would have known this script since all kinds of objects were flowing uh, from the east to the west in the 13th century, the Mongol period. And here's a helpful slide to give you a sense of what uh, sometimes is called the Pax Mongolica of the 13th century. So this extraordinary extent um, now connected, now uh, offering smooth pathways for all kinds of information and all kinds of things.
The Mongol presence is felt actually at various moments in this art, not only in Giotto. Here's um, another work. Uh, I just went to see it, so I'm excited about it. And uh, these are photos taken by uh, my wife, Amelia Saul, so enjoy them. Um, here is uh, a crucifixion in the Church of San Benedetto in Subiaco, so we're in the 1330s, most likely. And um, if you look pretty much in the same position as in Giotto, you find the group that is struggling over Christ's garment. There's been loss of paint here. Um, so you, you're seeing really just the bare outlines of what was once probably a beautifully described um, tunic. Now the two soldiers in front are practically coming to blows. Uh, or rather to um, blades. Um, the one on the right has already drawn his, or rather the one on the left has already drawn his dagger, and the one on the right is reaching for it. He's got his hand on the handle of his. The two figures behind um, are offering a different way of resolving the matter. One of them is holding out the dice, and the other is pointing to the dice. And then you have the figure in the middle, which is the great innovation here, who is wearing um, a conical hat, very long hair, clearly Asiatic features, um, a kind of um, beard that was typical of Mongols, and wearing a garment with a pattern that is familiar from the northern part of China, in the 12th century. There's probably better examples or comparanda than this, but this is one that's close by for me in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I think you can see the connection. It would have been nice to have the original paint on Christ's garment to see what that was made of. The Mongol extension produced a new connectedness between realms that had been out of touch for centuries. This sudden flow of information and goods also produced a new influx of pathogens to which Westerners had little to no immunities, and that is why within a few years of this painting, the population of Europe was decimated by the bubonic plague. The Black Death was a direct result of the arrival of a new global system. But back to our scene here. The central figure in this subdrama, this Mongol character, plays an unusual role. He's not sure if he, he's not sure about um, what is happening, about the sequence of events. He wants to delay the destructive impulses of the two soldiers in front. You'll notice there's a hand here, holding the hand of the one who's tugging on the tunic and holding his dagger. And that is the central figure's hand staying this impulse. He wants to preserve the tunic intact. His expression is quiet, even contemplative. He looks down at the robe as if he understands something of its significance, but not all of it. Now we can go back to Padua, where Giotto's fresco, the first one I showed you, was. Several decades after Giotto and down the road from Giotto's fresco in Padua is the Church of the Santo, the Church of Sant'Antonio, where Giotto's follower Altichiero offered a vaster and more populated rendition of the crucifixion scene. We find um, the subdrama around the robe in the right um, part of the picture. <coughs> Seamless and volumetric, it seems like a body made up of nothing but the skin of a body tumbling towards the ground. Its arms reach down to the clearing where the soldiers throw the dice onto a round board or possibly a shield. Alpicero's rendition is much more elaborate than Giotto's. It puts us far beyond what the Gospels describe. 
we now see bystanders pointing to the various things that are happening, commenting on them. So here's the detail. You can see this commentary going on. What are they saying? Are they entertained or mortified or both? The figure offering the tunic to the soldiers is not a soldier, but one of the Jews who had called for Christ's crucifixion. And so we see the tunic passing through several relays from the back of Jesus into the hands of the unbelieving Jews and then into the hands of the Roman soldiers, uh, one of whom will come away with the prize. The episode, an appendix of the crucifixion scene, actually becomes an allegory of cultural transfer. We see the robe going through its second handoff, and usually after two relays, things become hard to read. Original meanings and associations begin to slough off of an object after it's passed through several hands, just like Christ's robe coming off his body. And after the third relay, decided by the dice, what will the winner do with his trophy? Will he wear it himself? Will he clothe himself in the garment of Christ? Will he sell it off? Will he understand what the garment means? The Bible says nothing about the further history of this relic that had once been in contact with Christ's body. Now, the 1953 movie, The Robe, puts it in the hands of Richard Burton, who takes some time to figure out what its true significance is. Medieval legends abounded um, about where the tunic went from Jerusalem, and one of those trails lands the relic in the German city of Trier, where it was last exposed in 2012. In this painting by Fra Angelico from the predella of his San Marco altarpiece around 1440, we see the Syrian saints, Cosmos and Damien, and their brothers sent to their deaths by drowning, only to be saved by an angel. We're off the coast of southeastern Turkey, bordering Palestine. We see their persecutor, Lysias, having been defeated and now beset by devils. According to legend, he's a Roman proconsul, yet here he's shown as an Eastern potentate, enthroned on a carpet and dressed in elaborate silks. His attendants wear exotic headgear and robes hemmed with Eastern script. One of them sports a braid down his back in the Mongol fashion, and behind is a tower with a conical-looking roof, of the sort typical of Armenia, which is not far to the east. Italian art of the 14th and 15th centuries was arguably more open to the world than at any other time in its history, before or since. The story repertoire stays mostly the same from one, what one had seen in art before this point, but the descriptive ambitions of the art expand dramatically. Gold grounds fall away, and that means diverse landscapes, furnishings and settings of all kinds, a variety of ethnic types, architecture of different sorts, all come into the picture. A wider world comes into the picture, extending far beyond what the artist and most of his viewers had ever observed personally. By my guess, at least 90% of the art produced in this period points, in one way or another, to places and peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean and farther east than that. 
all those scenes in the life of Christ, most of the saints' stories, all the Old Testament subjects, beginning with Adam and Eve, expelled from paradise at the eastern end of the earth. To be a Christian artist was to be continually pointing to and depicting the wider world. And after the 13th century, there was more known about that world and more depicting of it going on in Europe. Is there another artistic tradition, and I ask this question really genuinely, is there another artistic tradition from any period, anywhere in the world, this dedicated to showing events that took place in other parts of the world, identifiable parts of the world, places that the artist had never seen? Increasingly, it took me this long to realize it, but increasingly this strikes me as a great peculiarity of this art, perhaps the greatest peculiarity of it. This is not to say that this art isn't also inevitably and intensively local, responding to local concerns, local exigencies, local cults, patrons with particular needs. This small work, for example, it's odd to see it so big, uh, is a Predella panel, one of a series of panels that stood below an altarpiece commissioned, sorry, in Florence by the Medici family for uh, the Church of San Marco. I don't know how many of you have visited Florence, but that is the church with the convent attached to it with all the beautiful Fra Angelico frescoes. So here is the main panel of the San Marco altarpiece, which stood above this smaller panel. Now a bit of a ruin, unfortunately. We see the Virgin and Child flanked by a number of saints with Cosmos and Damien kneeling before them. The word Medici means doctors, and the patron saints of the Medici are the doctor saints, Cosmos and Damien. So these are saints that show up a lot in Medici commissions. You can call them local saints in Florence, because as I say, they made frequent appearance in images of the period under Medici domination. But these were Syrian saints. And Fra Angelico knows that. He insists on it even in his painting. A global reach comes with the territory of Christian art. What changes after 1300 is that this art aims to describe more and more of the world connecting the global and the local. This holy court is set out of time and place, and yet these saints kneel on an Anatolian carpet. Hanging behind them, so on the other side, behind the throne of the Virgin, in another realm, really, is a cloth that experts tell me originated in Gujarat, India. The Holy Court is in no place in particular, yet it seems it must have Eastern furnishings. If one approaches close enough to the enthroned Virgin and Child, one, in fact, sees that there's an orb in the child's hand. And if you look closely at that orb, you find that it's actually a map. OK, let me see if I can get far enough away to point out what's going on. It looks like a blob, but it actually is a map. This is the Iberian Peninsula. That's the north of Africa. So this is the Italian Peninsula, the Greek Peninsula. This is present-day Turkey. And then this is Palestine. And X, or rather cross, marks the spot. Jerusalem is in the center of the world. So I, I, I take this um, map, and there are many like it, but I take this one at the center of Frangelico's painting as really a reflection of how this culture understood its own place in the world. And as you can see, its place in the world was rather off to the margin rather off the western margin of the world. Western Christian Christianity understood itself to be marginal, far from the center. The question motivating much of the art was, how does one make sacred art from here? Not just from down here on earth, but from over here, the western end of the earth. 
So for Christians of the Latin West, they had a particular relationship to geography. They were, of course, interested in the vertical movement of celestial influence, the way um, divine forces work on the earth. But they always understood that those vertical relationships were channeled, mediated through horizontal relationships that occurred over the surface of the world. Because of the importance of the Holy Land, the cross in the middle, the vertical relations were always in some combination with important horizontal relations. Now those horizontal relations, as you've already started to gather, I'm sure, require an elaborate system of mediations. Western art, especially after the Crusaders, who had been in the Holy Land for almost two centuries, the 11th and 12th centuries, um, Western art, after the Crusaders got themselves kicked out of the Holy Land at the end of the 13th century, became very good at managing transfers of information, mediations of information from the Holy Land and from further east. So an object that is um, physically moved from one place to another, like the relic of Christ's robe, presumably, is what I would call a first degree mediation. It's the actual thing being transported. It's undergoing a, a, a displacement, and therefore it is mediated, but it's a first degree mediation. When that gets broadcast, published in a print, or copied in a drawing, or reported on in a text, that's what we might call a second degree mediation. When that information is incorporated into a work of art, say, a reconstruction of a biblical event, say, a depiction of the crucifixion, that's a third degree mediation. When that work of art is copied by another work of art, and you see the pattern. Western works of art in this period, 14th and 15th centuries especially, are a tissue of mediations of different degrees. One way of describing um, the exciting developments that we term Renaissance art is to say that in that period, the chatter among the various visual media got very intense. And this was, I think, in, in large measure to do with all this interest in making things travel, making objects travel, but also making information travel. That chatter among the various media, drawings, sculptures, paintings of different sorts, texts, maps, all of that um, interaction among the media produced a new kind of self-awareness about the media. Uh, interest in comparisons among the arts, for example, which produced a new reflexivity about art itself, which in the 16th century, not long after, produced a whole new body of literature of art theory and art history. Um, it's an explosion in the 16th century of self-conscious writing about art. Where did that come from? In my view, it was prepared by two centuries of the media talking to each other. Andrea Mantegna spent his younger years in Padua intensively studying Giotto and also Altichiero. Here's a crucifixion he painted for the Church of San Zeno in Verona. He probably painted it in Padua, where we see Christ's body positioned just over the horizon in the exact center of the picture. He's the only figure that hovers above the earth. And yet the cross to which he's affixed plants him in a very clearly identified place on earth. The blood on the cross traces both punctual and durational time. There is the splatter caused by the initial blow of the nail into Christ's feet, and then there are the longer drips down the cross, as if the blood's path down to the skull at the bottom of the cross 
measure the time it took for the body to die. And the body is dead now. We're actually after the event. Things are dissolving. The stage is emptying. You can see those people, they're heading back to Jerusalem. Their entertainment finished for the afternoon. Who's left on the hill of Golgotha? Well, on Christ's right, our left, we've come to expect this now, are the saintly companions collecting around the collapsing figure of the Virgin. And to Christ's left, our right, the soldiers throw lots. These soldiers are in foreign territory, far from home and with insufficient provisions. One sits with his legs outstretched, revealing a hole in his footwear. A bald, bearded figure, swarthier than the others, is a recruit from a far-flung province, a sign of an overstretched Roman army. Again, the tunic is in the process of being handed over. A Roman soldier grabs it rather abruptly from the hands of a figure who seems to show regret at giving it up. The artifact is passing from a proximate source to a recipient who knows nothing of the meaning of its provenance, except for the fact that it came from Christ's back, but appreciates it for its intrinsic qualities. It has value. It has particular value, they realize, because it has no seam. It can't be divvied up like Christ's other belongings. Almost all Christian relic legends have the relics passing, spending a season in the hands of infidels before landing safely in Christian hands. So this art in general, I'm speaking generally again, the art that told these stories was familiar with things passing in and out of phases of oblivion, in and out of zones of comprehension. To depict what is not available to you locally, you rely on whatever media are available to you that can deliver the information. You represent Jerusalem on the basis of pilgrimage accounts, drawings, and maps. You clothe biblical figures in robes that you might know through imported textiles. You study Roman artifacts to learn about military gear. Now, the medium of painting had a particular relationship to all this transferring of information. Painting really got selected for in this period as the medium most able to take in information from other media and to represent those other media. Painting could do it all. It could represent the textiles, the furnishings, the books, the metalware, the ceramics, sculptures, buildings, people. Paintings became remarkably adept at putting all of this information into a seamless pictorial whole. As the reliance on all of these mediations intensified, painting emerged as the supreme medium of remediation. And I think this is really a critical part of how painting in this period rose, really uh, amazingly, unexpectedly, from a subordinate position among the arts to what I would call a kind of superintendent position. This happens between 1300 and 1500. We're so used to the idea that painting is a principal art. That I think it's easy to miss the drama of this come-from-behind victory of painting in this period. Bits and pieces of information coming through many different channels have gone into the making of this painting. But the result is an effect of optical consistency, as if you are just seeing what is there before you. But that effect masks an elaborate labor of compiling and processing. Rather than expose the fact that the painting itself is based on layers of transfers, this painting instead shows transfer happening in the historical event. And this is 
typical, I would say, generally of Renaissance painting of this period. It often represents transfers, threshold crossings, trajectories, migration, and in doing so, it was not only telling the Christian stories, although of course it was doing that, but I would say um, this art in, in depicting all of these voyages, all of these transfers, was actually transposing into thematic terms what went into the making of the pictures themselves. Here we see Christ's robe passing through several hands. And then who knows where it will go? The future is very much at stake here because this is a painting made for future viewers in Mantegna's day, looking back on the event. For the 14th century theologian, Johannes Tauler, the four-part division of Christ's possessions, and this is typical allegorization of this, of this event, the four-part division of Christ's possessions represent the extension of the benefits of Christ's sacrifice to the four quarters of the world. But of all his possessions, the tunic could not be divided, and so it represents the mysterious judgment of God who decides who is to receive the Holy Spirit, who is to be clothed in, in Christ, and whom not. Mantegna has the soldiers throwing lots on a circle segmented into alternating sections of red and yellow. Um, a kind of board for a board game, and in fact, it, it is modeled on board games, um, ancient ones. Uh, archaeologists find these in various places. They don't know what to call this game, so the modern word for it is rota. If you look it up online, you'll find this image and others of this evidence of this Roman board game. So Mantegna clearly adapted such a board. I don't know where he got the information about it. Did he see it with his own eyes? Did he see a drawing of it? It's the sorts of questions that continually come up. I don't think he knew of what game was played on these boards, but I think he did like the design. To make this pattern, you draw a cross, and then you draw an X through the cross add alternating colors, and you have a stark diagram of radial distribution. In the context of this episode, the board suggests that once the dice is thrown, are thrown, the robe could go in any direction. It is, the board, marked like a compass. In fact, uh, Mantegna neatly aligns the board's pattern with the cardinal directions, east, west, north, and south. Now you might well ask, how do I know that he's aligned the board with the cardinal directions? Um, and the fact is I do know, at least within the Christian tradition, I do know, because there's a long post-biblical but pervasive tradition that places Christ on the cross facing west on the western side of Jerusalem. All those crosses and crucifixes that hang in Christian churches are understood to be carrying a west-facing body. While we, in the west, orient ourselves towards the cross in the east. Here's one of many um, visualizations that I could show you uh, from 1475 here, showing the walled city of Jerusalem. You see the cross outside the city towards us. This is the Mediterranean. Uh, with the body facing us. This is the kind of basic topography that Mantegna had in his mind, because maybe he saw things like this. It could have been this, because this is later, but things like it. Now, the implications of this fact about Christ facing west on the cross, for me, were drawn most movingly by the poet John Donne, um, in his poem, Good Friday, 1613, Riding Westward. I won't try to gloss the poem, but there you find Dunn on Good Friday, driven by errands and cares, 
riding westward towards, a, towards an appointment on business and turning his back to Christ. <clears throat> the viewer looks from the west towards the east, towards the hill of Golgotha, outside the western walls of Jerusalem. So we see the hill rise, we see it slope away on the far side towards Jerusalem. Those who know the city can recognize the Tower of David, the highest point in the city, on Mount Zion, and a little further down to the west, towards us, a little bit to the north, is a round building modeled on the Dome of the Rock, which in the Latin West was often taken to represent the Jewish temple. And where are we in the foreground? Coming up the stairs in the foreground and visible only in part are two soldiers. They're shown at different heights, implying a flight of steps. Now these steps are well known to any Christian pilgrim who'd been to Jerusalem. There are 18 of them leading up to the raised site of Calvary. So even though this site has now been completely encompassed by a church, it retains the topography of the site. So you climb up to the hill of Golgotha inside the church. Pilgrims then has now counted the 18 steps as they mounted to the place of the crucifixion. So Mantegna's painting, to use my terms, is at least a secondary remediation of some other source, a drawing of the site, for example, that preserves this understanding of the way the land is there. A source like this one, for example, which happens to be amazingly enough at the same date as Mantegna, um, and made by someone who had been to Jerusalem and visited the place, and you can count them if you want, but there are 18 steps leading up to the site of Golgotha there. I don't pretend that Mantegna knew this manuscript, but it gives you a sense of what was out there. Maybe he saw something more casual, uh, like this on-site drawing. This comes after Mantegna, but you get the idea. This is an on-site drawing from the 1470s, um, and I'm going to make your head spin a little bit, because here we are inside Jerusalem, looking westward. <laughs> um, but the same monuments are there. The Tower of David. Oh, sorry. Uh, the temple, and then towards the western edge here, this is now contemporary Jerusalem, so the site of the crucifixion is now inside the city, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that encompasses the site of the crucifixion. And then anachronistically, he puts actually a scene of Christ carrying the cross to that spot. So this is an inversion in many ways, um, this drawing. It's not only looking west from the east, as opposed to Mantegna, who's looking from the west, uh, sorry, looking from the east to the west, as opposed to Mantegna, who's looking west to the east. But also, this is a drawing made from the present, looking past, whereas Mantegna's representation is from the past, pointing towards the future. We're looking at this, for, with Mantegna, we're looking at the site before there was any building there. We're looking at the actual use of the site in Roman times. You can see other holes in the rock where previous crosses had been planted. Christ wasn't the first person to be crucified on this site. You see the skulls and bones of previous victims amassed in the little cave to the left. This is still just the place in the city where the executions got done. And yet, it's a proleptic painting. How can it not be? We feel the future presence of the chapel and the church on this site, even in this historical scene. The stone summit of the hill looks something like a reticulated pavement. The figures in the foreground, those two soldiers, mount pre-architectural steps, or proto-architectural steps, precursors of the steps that are there now. 
In the crucifixion by Mantegna, we are looking, as I say, towards the east, towards the cross, facing us in the west. And even the lighting confirms the topographical sighting. If you look at the shadows, they fall at an angle, slight angle. In general, you see the shadows here. It is clear that we have a light source to the right and a little bit forward of the painting, which is to say that the sun is to the south and to the west, just as it would be in Palestine on an afternoon in spring. Are you beginning to become amazed by Mantegna? A little bit about the original location of this painting. The painting is actually a Perdello panel. It stood under a much larger panel in its original location, where we see an assembly of saints surrounding the Virgin in heaven. So standing in the church and looking towards the high altar, this is an oriented church, so the apse is in the east. Standing in the church and looking towards the high altar, the congregation looks eastward towards Jerusalem and beyond Jerusalem towards the earthly paradise in the east. In the crucifixion, which is right below in the center, we have the most central and most legible panel. Jerusalem is exactly where it should be, behind Christ, who faces us in the West. So when the painting was taken in 1797 by Napoleon and then hung as an independent panel and a marvelous example of Mantegna's artistry in the first modern national museum, then being founded in the Palace of the Louvre, the panel's function as a compass was entirely lost. So we might ask, when the panel was in place in Verona, how was this vision eastward actually anchored to its local setting? That's going to be a problem in this art. If it's depicting faraway places, how does it make it relate to where we stand? So once again, we have to look at the bottom edge of the panel, since that's where it makes contact with this world. No, you thought I was done with the painting, but I'm sorry, I have to keep going. <laughs> the, soldier, the soldiers climb up into the picture through a threshold space. There's no other way to describe it. They climb up from our side of the picture. They're climbing up those steps that pilgrims have climbed up for centuries. The white lance tip of the one soldier drives upward, his gleaming white blade set off against the wood grain of the cross and curiously contained within the form of the cross beam. It's a very uh, sort of emphatic placement in the picture, and it must be a reference to the lance that was used to pierce Christ's side which, according to legend, had come westward, as so many other relics had. It was, at that time, in Nuremberg. And this is all a cue that this is the figure of Longinus, who pierced Christ's side and then was converted. But there's an oddity here, because he's still coming up the steps, and the lance tip is pristine. But Christ's side is already pierced and bloody. The body's dead. So we have here a little glitch in chronology, and I think it is also a glitch in the painting's medial rhetoric. I don't quite know how to explain it, but we're dealing with Mantegna here. You have to deal with it. You have to try to grapple. So here's one speculative suggestion. The bottom edge is where the picture meets the church altar, it's not only a spatial threshold in this sense, it's a temporal one. Every mass set on the altar directly below folds time over onto itself, reiterating Christ's sacrifice and directing its benefits into the present. In this zone, 
this lower part of the picture where it starts to come into contact with our world, the seamless visual fabric of the picture starts to break down. The lance here is inside the scene, of course, but it emerges from below. Part of the lance is actually not visible. Part of the lance is, as it were, outside the picture in our space. It emerges from below, from a ritual space outside the picture. It is a historical element, but it is also the relic that has come down to Mantegna, down to Mantegna's time, now presented again. The way it is set against the cross emblematically, like a relic, suggests that it is also not quite in the picture, but overlaid onto the picture from our space and our time. In the distance, we see the people returning eastward towards Jerusalem, returning to their daily lives. Those lives are the unrecoverable facts of history. It's the quotidian life that's usually not recorded. In the foreground, we have the other extreme, uh, the liminal zone of temporal interference, I would say. And in between the two, still remaining on the hill of Golgotha, are the events that matter, the events that spell our future. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Alex. And there will be a little time for questions. If anyone has a question, can they um, raise their hand and wait for a mic to arrive? It's really important that we can all hear your questions as well as Alex. Thank you very much. Stick your hand up if you have a question. Don't be shy. Yes, exactly. Someone has to ask the first question. Okay, there's one over here. Just wait for a second. I was just curious whether the um, you thought the lands had a connection with the uh, the host um, rising up and the uh, connection to the piercing and then um, and and obviously the fact that it's clean and then. It, the, trans, the act of transubstantiation, whether that has a connection. And the other thing I was going to ask was whether um, your research is related to Gordon Bailey and what he's doing in trans sort of continental re Renaissance research. Who, who, uh, 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 Gordon Bailey. Go, Gordon sorry. Bailey. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, whether you have some connection with him, that was all. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, the, to answer the, the second question first, yes, in general. His, his field is, tends to be later than mine, um, and I think it really belongs to a different, um, an emergent, different world system than the one I'm describing, uh, where the Jesuits, his specialty is the Jesuit uh, impact on art and the world. The Jesuits are fanning out from the new center that is Rome, and um, really marking out a kind of centripetal understanding of the world with Europe at the center, which I, I don't think is really the case here. The popes in Rome in the 15th century are trying their best to reestablish Rome as a center, but they're not quite there yet. It's a work in, work in progress. So we're telling two phases of a linked story, I, I would say. Um, the, the point about the host, I think, is a very good one, and I probably should have put it in those terms. Um, the point I was trying to make uh, by invoking the mass was just that, that you have this representation of an historical event, and then you have this ritual context unfolding repeatedly in front of this painting that reiterates in many ways the meanings of the painting, showing that what's depicted in the painting has a kind of efficacy in the present. So that's happening continuously, and thank you. I think that's a much better way to put it. What I see happening with that figure, the lance overlaid on the cross, is a kind of overlay that people were very familiar with. The same thing again, done in the present. Um, so that's the lance in the scene, but also the lance that's come down to us and is now 
a revered relic and shown in our world. Um, so th I would say it's a similar relationship, but I wouldn't want to say that the lance has Eucharistic meaning or something like that. It's the, the similarities are for me structural. Do you feel that the lance is being risen up to the cross is a, is a metaphor of the host being raised? Uh, I think structurally those movements are similar and they obviously both reflect a kind of uh, aspiration upwards. In, in the moment of delivering the lance <coughs> he's he's doused and, and is converted. So it's an ironic kind of upward gesture. A, 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 a death blow that also becomes the source of life. Um, so different, but in some ways I'm sure a better preacher than me could have made a wonderful connection between the two. But, um, yeah. Um, you were saying something else, though, about the lands that I thought was interesting. It'll come to me in a moment, maybe. We have another couple of questions. One at the back, and then one down. It's interesting that um, you um, emphasize the the sense of uh, Renaissance uh, mobility um, and a kind of a, an emancipation of, um, of painting. Um, do you think that there wasn't also a kind of a, a sym symbiotic um, sense of having to work within uh, canonical parameters um, particularly when you think about uh, the Jesuitical um, uh, agenda. Mm. Um, well, I mean, I, I think your question is a very important one. The Jesuits come afterwards, so I think we'll leave the Jesuits aside when we're talking about the 14th and 15th centuries, but I take the, the basic point about canonical forms. This is, this is the tension of Renaissance art. You have an art that's working in very traditional ways. Um, in many ways, the patronage structures are not that different from what had existed before. And yet the art is changing. It's changing pretty radically. Uh, occasionally, especially towards the later part of the 15th century, and there's some episodes involving Mantegna that would be of interest in this regard, occasionally the, the changes in the art change the way the patrons behave in relationship to commissioning art. So th there, th there's a very dynamic and fantastically complex set of relationships there, which is the story of Renaissance art, I would say. Um, I shouldn't say that all the patron structures stay the same. Of course, there's an emergent burger class that is commissioning art in a way uh, different from traditional ecclesiastical commissions. They're basically horning in on ecclesiastical space. They want to be buried in the churches, and they want their altarpieces to doing and the various other elements of the chapel to be doing good work for them. So that that privatization of piety, which has been very uh, elaborately studied, does have an important effect on on, on the art. Uh, also, nonetheless, that too has its traditions and its structures and its patterns. Um, so, n n I, I thank you for giving me that question because I wouldn't want anyone coming out of this room saying, oh, Renaissance art was a free-for-all. Um, in fact, m most of, this, of the um, developments that I was describing in this lecture are, of course, driven by, by theological concerns and concerns about accuracy, biblical and hagiographical accuracy. These, these artists are really, in my view, um, these artists are deeply Christian artists. They're trying to get to the bottom of things. And I could imagine actually arguments against me saying, come on, you know, they didn't care as much about religion as you think. But I, I tend to think, I tend to give them a lot of credit in that sense. When you come to someone like Mantegna, well, he's, he's interested in everything. <clears throat> Mantegna is supposed to have been amongst the first to paint on canvas. Um, is there any sense in which that um, influenced 
the content of his painting or that more generally painting on canvas changed what painting depicted? Yeah. Um, so this tends to happen towards the later part of his life, later 15th century. He starts making small pictures on linen, actually. Um, one's in the Getty, Adoration of the Magi, another, the Eche Homo is in Paris. Um, and I actually, um, I have a lot to say about those paintings in relation to this subject. I, I feel like they, they're driven by many of the same concerns that I um, tried to reveal in this lecture but taking them in new directions because the format is new. It's not just that he's painting on uh, cloth rather than wood. It's that the fact that he's painting on cloth means that the paintings had probably no original or, um, or intended location. These were paintings that were made to be mobile from the beginning, and that to me is very important in relation to all of these themes about the local and the global. Um, it was, it was a, I mean, we, we can, I think we can understand the significance of it given tablets and um, phones and laptops, and, um, the way that our connection to the world is activated and made more various, more interesting in some ways by our ability to move with the information. Um, so that, that's happening around 1500, but not at this phase. So that, that, thank you. That's another indication of just how dynamic these developments are. Every decade brings something pretty important, I would say. There's someone right in the middle. Uh. Sorry. Can you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Keep the hand raised. Oh. Thank you, Professor Nagel. Uh, you mentioned on Mantegna's crucifixion that the painting was made for future viewers. Yeah. Can you? elaborate on the sense of future viewers at that point in time, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I said the painting is made for future viewers. I, I think what I meant was the painting is depicting a subject whose meaning is realized by future viewers. So the sacred significance, what makes the crucifixion different from all the other um, executions that happened on that spot, according to Christians, is it spells the future. It, it's, um, it's an event that has trans-historical significance and, in fact, sacramental significance. So when you say the Mass, you are making active again the benefits issuing from that event. So all Christian art, I would say, all Christian art it, it, when it's serious about its purposes, is honoring the fact that the true significance of the biblical event finds its fulfillment in the future. And that, in fact, the very depiction of the event by the artist is evidence of that fulfillment. It's more evidence of the efficacy of the event, that it's being depicted now, continuing to have an effect. Does that make sense? So futurity is built into depictions of Christian events. And then in the hands of someone like Mantegna, well, it becomes very interesting to him. Because all of these temporal relations become exciting. And of course, he's, he's someone very interested in antiquity and what, what remnants of antiquity made their way down to him. So how can we not be interested in what remnants of his work will come down to us? So it's, a, it's, it's at, at its core a Christian problem about time that then becomes really a kind of source and inspiration for all kinds of artistic reflections about time. And 
Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just curious to go back a little bit to some of the global questions that you were raising. Yeah. Um, and something that a detail that I know is incidental ultimately to the larger context of your talk, but you started among other things by saying in reference to the um, the script like or the scriptish uh, order on a robe and a jello. Yeah. A certain, you know, quite possibly, or I don't remember your exact verbiage, quite possibly or quite likely Jodo would have known that script. Yeah. But I'm curious about, aside from, leaving aside for a moment, the question of what it is to know how to write in Mongol in, in, in that period, uh, if you're Italian. What the, just so uh, if you give not, us- It's not actual Mongol script, it's just- um, so he would have been formally with the aesthetic. Formally similar, similar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see. So, so then that gets more of my core question. If you could just introduce us a little bit to the to the objects that would have carried that, to the people that would have suggested the swarthy figure in the montagna, to the to the sort of visual culture that brings the global into Italy in the period that you're discussing. Right. Well, I tried to show a few examples of the kinds of things that came into um, the purview of someone in landlocked Verona. You know, um, but there are many more that I could have shown you. Um, so normally, I'm, I was just worried about getting off on a tangent. But normally, when I show the script in the Jalto, I'll show you a Mongolian passport of exactly the same date uh, with with pasta script. And it's a wonderful object because for someone like Jalto who wouldn't have known how to read the script, it's actually not clear which way you're supposed to read it. And I think that rotational freedom, if you will, is actually evident in the way Jotham adapted the script. You can see, you can see him kind of taking different views of the script. Um, uh, in all, all so this the the silk that I showed you from 12th century China now in the Met, and it looks very much like the robe worn by that Mongol in the Subiaco painting. Uh, very similar silk was found in the tomb of Can Grande de la Scala in Verona, um, 14th century. So these things were kind of everywhere uh, in Italy. If you we all know about how luxury goods travel. People will get their hands on luxury goods. Um, and when you say silk in this period, you mean Eastern silks. Although the Italians are starting to, starting to get in on the act and making pretty good ones. But they're Eastern silks. Every new thing that comes out, when porcelain starts to hit Europe in the mid 50s and later 15th centuries, Immediately, you start to see it popping up in paintings. Um, there are just so many examples of it. The swarthy figure, uh, there were lots of dark skinned people in Italy at this time. There's some pretty good history that John Gagne can tell you about, uh, about the, the multicultural presence um, in especially places like Venice, but not only places like Venice. Isabella d'Este in Mantua, for example, this is now later in the 15th century, collected black servants and remarks in her letters on how she got a really good ebony black one, you know, recently. I was very happy with her. Um, this was a thing to do, evidently. Um, is that what, what you were asking for? Time for uh, one question or two quick ones. Uh, there's one down here. Um, I just wanted to just wait for the mic. Sorry, but we can't. If you couldn't hear me with my so microphone, but are uh, facing the audience. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to ask about the, um, you know, the early Renaissance, the Byzantine uh, Madonna and Child images, uh -huh. um, and often have wondered whether or not they came to um, Italy 
out of the sack of Constantinople. Yeah. You know, there, there's so many of them, and what, you know, how did they get there? I guess is the question. How did, what, what was yeah, the question? Where, where, how did they get to, how, so many of them? Oh, you know, uh, okay. They, where yeah. did they come from, you know? Okay. Um, so you, you were right that the sack of Constantinople in 1204 produced a stream of objects, not only icons, but relics. Many of the treasuries in, in Western Europe got enriched uh, after the sack of Constantinople. Uh, so the, the moment of the sack produced a lot of flow, but um, it's also true that the, the Crusaders were in Constantinople for decades after that point. So the, the exchange, the contact, the depth of knowledge about those works is, I think, uh, not to be underestimated. Um, but I think an important point needs to be made about those imports. We, our historians, are a little bit too good about dating things. We can't help but call it what it is, according to us, meaning Paleologian, if it's Paleologian. Uh, communion, if it's communion. We date those icons. We know how to date them. Renaissance collectors, and, and by the way, Renaissance collectors loved antiquities. They also collected icons. They didn't know the dates of the icons. In fact, many of the icons had legends dating them back to the time of Christ. Um, so they were antiquities for these people. And I think that's an important part of why uh, they were so important to Renaissance artists. Almost every major Renaissance artist has a moment or more where they're intensively responding to one of these Byzantine works. And in Mantegna's case, there are several such moments. You wouldn't have had the Renaissance without them, I think, basically. So that's in contradiction to the maybe familiar narrative still there in textbooks that says that Renaissance art arose in opposition to Byzantine art. Uh, it's not true. I mean, it definitely changed the terms. It changed many things in the art. It didn't look like Byzantine art anymore. But the fascination with Byzantine art propelled it all the way through. Really in the 16th century when there's just a kind of total, well not total because in some places it continues, but in the 16th century you get a real shift away from the aesthetics of the icon. But that's really after 1500. And maybe it's to do with this um, orientation in the earlier period to Eurocentrism in the later period shift. I don't know. I think on that further uh, note of controversy. Yes. We better end uh, here because it's now coming 7.30. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Vicky for helping us make this come about. And especially I'd like to thank you, Alex, for a wonderful